Welcome to Font Tribute, where we talk about fonts and their attributes. Font Tribute. This is Thomas Jockin from Type Thursday. I hope you're all having a great week. So, here we are. We're going to lose italics. And as promised, we've now moved on to sans serif italics. So I think for a lot of people wearing typeface design or observing typefaces, I think a lot of them assume it's that sans serifs are just obliques. They're just the, the normal Roman, just slanted. And that's understandable. And in fact, there's a lot of typefaces that, typefaces that do do that. Uh, I do want to point out, though, that that's not necessarily a given. That's not always have to be possible. So I wanted to showcase with you a sans serif that does employ a lot of the considerations and thoughts that we've been talking about with the serif designs onto a sans serif. So let's get started. So in this case, I'm going back to Gil Sans. I've talked about Gil Sans in previous episodes as a humanist sans serif. And a part of the reason also why you can say Gil Sans is a humanist sans serif is because of how it chose to design its italic. So let's start looking at some of these examples. I think one of the first things you will notice is remember the main notes from the from the serif designs was really italics ultimately really have two momentums. There's the primary momentum, right, of the stem of the stems. This is what we think about with the kind of the obliquing effect of what we expect to see, which we see here. But there's also a secondary mo motion. It's kind of basically how do things like the joints move over to the shoulder in this case, or if this if this was a san if this was a serif design, uh how the terminals starting and ending would operate in this case. Notice that, again, this focus of notice where this slant, the stress of this joint is compared to the Roman edition between the two of them. It's lower, it's a lower arch and there seems to be more white space kind of edged out in that joint to stem area compared to the Roman counterparts. There also appears to be some narrowness. The N has been made more narrow compared to its Roman counterpart. So notice that the narrowing of widths as opposed in addition to obliquing, as well as the secondary stroke motions are being considered as well. You can also see it uh, by the, look at the shape of the counter. You know, kind of if you notice this kind of counter shape, notice its its profile it's is inherently different. It's a different nature. It's kind of notice it's much more abrupt and sharper on this quadrant over here as then it goes down to the stem. So we can see that the profile of the, of the design has changed in its, in its italic form. And this point about narrowness and whatnot as we discussed in, in the end we definitely see in the O. And we actually notice that across the board usually the O's seem to get way more narrower in their italic forms than in the Roman forms. So just take notice of, the whole, of how wide and circular that O is uh, versus this narrowness of this O, uh, for example. Also, it also it, you can also actually sense to see that, look at the contrast structure. It actually looks like to compensate for the narrowness that there's been an introduction of more contrast in the kind of top and bottom thin parts of the O in this case, compared to the left and right thick parts of the bowl, of the whole shape. It's, you know, it's very fascinating. That's why, you know, I think as a texture, the italic for Gil Sans, it, it feels relatively different. Like it, you can tell they're the same. You can tell they're a similar design, but there's little nuances that uh, I, I don't think just obliquing the Roman would give you the same effect. The D is also another great example where as a type designer, I'm, I'm always looking for the italics kind of, if you're looking, if you're using a design that is an italic, there's these secondary stroke motions that are just as important as the primary obliquing effect. So obviously here we have the obliquing, right? That, the slant versus the vertical. But here's what's interesting. Notice that in the Roman, there's this flatness in the bottom, right? And there's a certain kind of dipping down in the joint of the D, Roman. Meanwhile, in the oblique, uh, that, there is no flatness. In fact, instead, there's actually a slight arching on the bottom. And then there's a flatness at the top. So it's actually that you actually reverse the order, the kind of priority of stroke systems in the italic. 
So this kind of gives kind of, you know, in my mind, kind of a feeling similar to what we would have with an italic, right? Uh, a certain kind of arching on the bottom and a certain flattening on the top as a form, which we do not see in the, in the Roman counterpart. You can also see it because look at the kind of the weight distribution. Notice there's a certain kind of profile of arching on this top left corner that doesn't really exist as much. In fact, the momentum of the italic seems to be pushing more down to the bottom left, as we've seen in other italic designs in the serif design profiles. So again, very fascinating. It's, it goes to show that Gil Sands is an italic. It's much more nuanced than a simple obliquing effect of the Roman counterpart. In the A, we, we get to see more what we would expect. So... I mean, one thing, the main note you can definitely see is we move from a two-story A to a one-story A. We can see that because notice there's a bolt and then there's a top terminal up here versus it's all just one shape. It's been simplified and streamlined. And, and again, notice the kind of, usually when you do a one-story A, you normally want this to speak in vocabulary in some way with what we saw in the D before, right? But it's not exactly, it's... It's close, but there's some differences. I think the main note you would see is because instead of just con closing off, right, as a D would, like over here, it just kind of closes and goes into the stem, the A has to create this counter space, right, in the joint. It has to introduce that kind of thinking, that uh, complication. So the curve profile has to get adjusted. And the main note you would see is the amount of contrast, right? So notice how, you know, notice the, the weight distribution between the stem, the top part of this bowl, the primary part of the bowl on the left, down to the bottom area, and then connecting from the bottom of the bowl over to the stem. Notice the thinning that happens in this quadrant over here. The E moving on, again, we can see a narrowness of the form. So again, it's been adjusted for narrowness. And it appears also the you know for notice the vertical stress terminal of the e in the roman counterpart next to the kind of sheared addition we see in the e and the italic also again for me what i'm watching for is notice how this terminal kind of arches up there's a momentum this kind of momentum over here is different from the momentum we feel in the roman counterpart so Again, this is kind of when you're looking for italics, it's more the question beyond of where where the obliquing happens, but where does the secondary momentum strokes lead my eye and kind of create the bounciness and, and kind of flowiness of the text that italics look to create. Even as a sans serif, this design is still thinking about that. But there's also some similarities. Also, notice that. Uh, as opposed to being a pure cursive, right? Basically, one would expect something like this, for example, like kind of a curved profile for the crossbar. Instead, in this design, it's chosen to maintain a, a kind of rationalized crossbar. So we can see there's been some kind of streamlining or abstracting from italic forms in, in cursive designs into this sans serif design. The C, I think, is a great example of, again, this idea of, like, what are the secondary momentums of the strokes? So, notice, again, we have the main obliquing, right? This is the main thing we're looking at. But more importantly, I'm seeing, notice how this cur curve profile on the bottom is versus this top. It has this flatness, exactly like the D. You know, we saw a similar methodology in the D, uh, or in the A in this case. Just the C which seems to really call it out, because if this was truly oblique, I think it'd be very safe to say you would expect... Uh, that terminal on the top to curve in way more, curve downward way more than it is doing so in this case. So this is the example, the example of it's looking to create this secondary momentum in addition to the obliquing effect that we that the design is trying to incorporate. Oh, and also as well, please notice notice the curve profile of the Roman. You know, kind of feels very stable overall with, with basically a certain push in the bottom with a certain amount also on the top left meanwhile in the italic c of gale sands again this kind of bottom left quadrant is the real it's really where the momentum of the stroke of the construction's all going um and everything else kind of has to counterplay off that so 
as a form, it's more unstable. It's actually inherent. I think a good way to think about italics is it's probably reason why, again, why they're, 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 I think, more challenging to design done in a successful manner than Romans is because they're inherently like these unstable forms by themselves that have to, they become harmonious when they're put together into words. And I think this, is, this C is a great example of that. On the G, you know, this, I think this, even when this seems like an oblique version, they notice some differences here. Take a notice of the, how the loop is handled, the whole bottom section, compared to the Roman. It's much smaller. If this was, if this was oblique, I think we would expect it to be out to here, on uh, that quadrant. So, it's been reduced in size, like so this area over here, notice it's smaller. Also notice where the link hits up. Not the link, excuse me, the... From the spine over to the loop where it connects uh it's much higher up right so we, I, we would expect it probably up around here to connect if it was oblique instead it's connecting much lower down uh on the spine we can also see that because look at the counter shape notice this counter shape is kind of this oval shape abstracted oval versus this pinching kind of uh teardrop shape kind of like a Hershey Kiss, almost like a flat and Hershey, Hershey Kisses uh, counter in the in that loop area. We can also say, looking at it too, even the proportion of that of this top area too. This almost this almost top bowl has been uh, narrowed compared to kind of or elongated. And they actually, besides being maybe being squished, it's kind of more been pushed downward. Uh, as opposed to this kind of longer proportion of this top part between the two of them. So again, very fascinating nuances to show. The Gil Sans italic is not an oblique, it's a, a real italic design with intentions and designs that are different from its Roman counterparts. I'm gonna close with the P. I think the P in Gil Sans is actually funny because it's almost to the point where you would I think if you don't, if you didn't understand the context of where this design was coming from, you you'd be very puzzled. Because notice that this weird terminal treatment at the on this P, it's completely on. You don't see this anywhere else in the design. It's kind of all over the. It's kind of wild. It's not really what you would expect, uh, especially compared let's compare it to its Roman counterpart. Like take notice, uh, this is incredibly rationalized. Right, follows through in a very rationalized manner. Uh, instead, I brought over the the Garamond edition italic just to show uh, it's calling from his idea of like this stem that connects from the top, pulls through just like this, and then you have this terminal that starts over here, loops back, and come and up and around. Well, in this case, also it's very interesting to note. It kind of notes with the, the where it hits. I think what one we would expect it to hit is higher up, like kind of like that, right? But instead, the design chooses to go way deeper on this arch over here, pull it up, up and around, and then kind of flatten at the bottom. It's a it's a very idios, idiosyncratic method in Gil Sands. And honestly, I think this is why some people kind of get a weird aesthetic with Gil Sands. Looking at the italic, it's like kind of like, what? Where did that come from? It's an odd part of the project, I would say. I mean, partly where it came from was... Again, it's it's possibly humanist sans serif, like from a humanist calligraphy source, and this is like I take it as Gil Sans' approach to how to incorporate that. Personally, would I do that decision? I don't know. I think it's probably not to be honest with you, but I just wanted to point it out. I, I want to incorporate this peak because I thought this is a really clear example that the mental model of Gil Sans as an italic is calling from this humanist italic sourcing, and not and kind of trying to come to terms of the sans serif uh low contrast model with its with this historical sourcing from the past with some rather uh interesting quirks to deal with the resolutions of those conflicts but that's the beauty of type design is that you know a lot of times we're trying to resolve contradictions in design systems and thinkings and Part of the role of a type designer is to try to test out different ideas and see how things parse out. And a big theme in type design is mixing different parts to make a cohesive whole. Uh, and if you if, if you think that this example of the terminal of the P is not the right example, then 
you're more welcome to give it a shot for yourself and see what experiments and what computations make sense for you for the projects that you're trying to do with your typeface projects. Or better yet, quite frankly, uh, if you're not making typefaces, but perhaps designing them, not designing them, excuse me, uh, selecting typefaces for projects, well, this is a mode of how you can think about italics. Like, okay, maybe you want italics to match with the with the as title case, for example. In this case, I'll move on to the final slide. Uh, Gil Sand's italic is, is very, very different from its Roman counterpart. It has a different flavor and feeling beyond it that's beyond the just obliquing. It's almost, you actually could use it in kind of, say your titles could be in the italic and the body copy could be in the Roman. And you can actually justify that reason because it, it wouldn't be so boring as just obliquing the Roman. It actually has a flavor and a voice and texture that's different from its Roman counterpart. And that's part of why you can make some discernments in your selecting your typefaces. Perhaps that's what you're looking for. You know, other times you don't want your italic to be so grat and like kind of standing out for itself and have a different texture that extreme. And that's why there's other designs out there to choose from or design for yourself if you're thinking about making your own typefaces. So this has been Fontribute. This I'm Thomas Jockin from Type Thursday. I hope you learned a lot from this discussion. Maybe I'll talk more about italics. We've been going on for four weeks now with this. <laughs> so let me know if you're still interested in learning more about the italic designs and other sans serif projects now in this case. Or we can move on to different topics. But hey, feel free to leave a comment on YouTube. Love to hear more about you guys and what you're thinking and how you're enjoying this process of discussion about fonts on Fontribute. This is Thomas Shockin. Have a great weekend and talk to you soon. Bye.